This is Tabby. And this is Holly. And you're listening to Plant Based Nation. We're getting very close to double digits. Oh my That's God. exciting. Okay. April 19th, we will be at Fairfax Veg Fest down in VA. Um, and it's an mm-hmm. all day festival. Yes. We will have a booth set up, uh, we'll have some goodies to give away. Uh, we will be recording at some point. We would love to have some people on um, and we'll be promoting and saying hi. It'll be great. It'll be a fun time. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to give a quick update on the blog because we just had. OK, so I don't really push it that yeah, much, I don't think, I don't think on the show um that'll change you really don't um and i probably should (laughs) that'll change yeah okay so we have um we have our website which is plantbasednationpod.com and also on that website is actually a blog and we use that blog to sort of uh provide everybody with updates about content and about episode updates um, or episode drops, I should say. Um, I've just added like a corrections tab because um, we had a couple minor corrections or clarifications to make about episode six, which you can uh, check that out. It's nothing super major, but um, and we also have a guest uh, blogger come in once a month and write about something that they sort of like specialize in or something that they are, you know, have certain expertise in that right. Holly and I don't have. <laughs> so um, basically, <laughs> although, um, although Holly, I think that, you know, yeah. I, you've, you've taught anthropology courses before. Um, and so I think you can relate a little bit to our recent post, yeah, which actually got the most post. traffic um, so far. It was that one. And yeah, Carrie's post. So, um, sh- so it was written by uh, Carrie Sansphere, who has a PhD in anthropology, and she's a professor of anthropology and archaeology. For those of you interested, you should check it out. I got a lot of positive feedback, which was cool. So, let's see. Do you have any updates or announcements um, or anything? I'm going to see Celine Dion in concert on Wednesday. <laughs> You are. Is that why? Okay. Earlier when I tuned in, I heard you talking Alexa. to Alexa. I was trying to get her to play Celine Dion. Yes. <laughs> I heard that. I was like, and I was like, did you just Celine Dion? I have my Echo in my living room and I'm in my bedroom and I was like trying to yell to my Echo for Alexa to play Celine Dion. And then my Amazon Fire tablet is in my bedroom going like, but loop playing Celine Dion and then it started to play very softly and I was like wait how did that work (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know you were a Celine Dion fan you know I I I mean I think every woman born between 1980 and 1995 is a Celine Dion fan in some respect but and and I guess I should say every woman born between 1960 and 1995 but uh, my a friend of mine's husband bought her tickets bought her two tickets with the notion that she and one of her friends would go because he refused to go. So, oh no! <laughs> but we <laughs> spent Aww. major money on these tickets, and she, last Aww. week she's like, "So you want to go see Celine Dion with me on Wednesday?" And I was like, mm, "Wednesday's a school night." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Because I get up real early to teach on Thursdays, and then I said, "If you don't find anybody else, of course I will go with you." So she texts me today. Aww. She's like, "She's like, please go with me. <laughs> please can we nerd out to Celine Dion?" So, Aww. so I was oh, like, cool. "Oh, cool! Yeah, it'll be awesome. I'll be super tired the next day, but you know what? Yeah, you will. I'll just that's okay." I'll just tell the kids I went to the Celine Dion concert and they'll be like, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> who is I'll be that? Like, you know who I'm talking about. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's cool. I hope you have fun. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, other than that, um, no announcements. <laughs> let's see. Oh, I have a I guess I have a minor personal announcement, which I thought was cool. So on February 29th, it was Rare Disease Day and 
somebody I know gave me a little t-shirt to raise awareness about this condition that I'd actually never heard of before called a uh, bee pan. I don't know if you've heard it before, but um, I have, but I don't remember what it is. So it's a rare uh, neurological, I think it's a, neuro, yeah, it's a neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disease and it causes iron buildup in the brain. People who have it, they inevitably, the person develops progressive oh, wow. dementia between adolescence to middle adulthood. So it's like, it's crazy. Um, So anyway, I hadn't heard about this disease before, but I was really excited to get this shirt. And um, so I'm going to wear it this week to advertise (laughs) at at, uh, my job. And what's kind of a bummer about it is that uh, there's only like around 100 kids who have ever been diagnosed with this before. And because of that, there's basically absolutely no research out there or drugs or anything that can like cure this disease. So it's all about symptom management, early intervention and all that stuff. Um, So yeah, I didn't know it was a rare disease awareness day until I like looked at Twitter. Um, over the weekend, because a lot of celebrities were like uh, endorsing it, um, so I thought that was kind of cool. So, um, yeah. yeah, I feel like I would like to tie into our show more. Um, well, and we're working on it too. More representation for like plant based lifestyles for people who are not who are either like differently abled or yeah. um not neurotypical um yes. because there's so much that has to do with um well and two we are going to be discussing eventually we're going to be discussing <laughs> like poverty and plant-based diets yep. and yes, how yes. those intertwine um yes but it's so i feel like it's so important to be aware of just everyone else's potential for their situation to be different. Than yeah, yours. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I think that's something that isn't always thought about, um, whether you're plant-based or not. I think that that sometimes gets overlooked. I think a lot of people assume, at least I've seen this within the vegan community, a lot of people just assume that everybody uh, can adhere to that lifestyle or has the ability to, but like, right. you know, um, they, I think that there is room to acknowledge that there are some people who would really struggle making that work. Um, yeah, just like because I, of like limitations they might have. For yeah, a number um, of reasons, whether they're physical, whether they're financial. Um, right. There's a lot of food sensitivities with certain uh, health conditions. And some people could be so sensitive that it's just like an achievement just to be able to eat anything, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's a very it's a small percentage of the population, but I think it's still something for people to be mindful of because I do see that online and social media I'll see like when um, people in the vegan community or even plant-based eaters I've seen vegetarians say it too where they'll yeah. give somebody a hard time who claims that oh I can't eat that because and this is the issue that I have yeah. and I, I just don't like seeing that because um, you know it's not cool like <laughs> it's just not cool right. it's not cool like you don't know anything about that person's um challenges day to day like you don't know you don't like they could very well have a very good reason like it could be that they can't they literally have to only eat certain things daily and it just happens to be things that unfortunately are not plant-based um yeah so And and I think that's like the crux of it is you know promoting the well-being of all creatures and at the same time like not promoting the sacrifice of human life for the benefit of animal life, basically. Um, yeah, you know I, I think mean? it's a, well, I think it's, um, I think it's just a very personal journey in yeah. general. And so yeah. like, I, I personally probably 
would have no problem in some circumstances equating those two things, but that's my personal perspective and experience, and I don't expect that other people would share that ideological perspective with me right now. You know, I think that, and then I think that there are vegans out there or plant-based eaters who um, would agree with that too. So I think it's just different. I think everything is, uh, it's very personal and I think people need to, um, I don't know, ease up a little bit on each other. I'm kind of more interested in, I think the more immediate problem is just um, changing how large scale agribusiness is run. I think that's like the main priority for me anyway. That's the main interest that I have at the moment. Yeah. Well, it definitely Um, feels like the more, the more, I guess, research we do and the more we look at the large scale operations of things and how much they really like impact yeah because i think a broad scale i'm, I'm I think definitely that, like right uh, there with you yeah i think that personal ethics they're just so they're so subjective you know still mm. um and i think they always will be and just historically they have been from person to person yeah so i think it's more important at this point in time to try and focus on implementing change with policy and sort of highlight the problems within that industry, because I I actually think that is more likely to connect with somebody who is outside of the plant-based mindset than to play the empathy card. And I hate to say that, but I think that that's true. (laughs) I mean, I think that's true across the board, like not just with animal welfare, not just with sustainable like products and practices, but also like with healthcare. I mean, Right. No right. individual really thinks that another individual should suffer. Um, right. But it's you, you'd be really hard pressed to convince a lot of people in this country that they should feel like everyone deserves health care because we have been right. so mentally programmed to think that health care should not be a right to think it's a benefit. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's <laughs> you true. Know, I hadn't so, thought of that. That's a really good analogy. That's yeah, a good like analogy. tackling the issue the the broader the broader context and the broader um effect with policy instead of like trying to convince your conservative uncle that everyone should have like medicaid <laughs> for all basically you know yeah, and that yeah. he should vote for bernie like <laughs> right right <laughs> you know it's, it's gonna be much more effective if we just like take down the monster that is in the industrialized private healthcare insurance complex so <laughs> right right exactly yeah well and well, i think too empathy in a lot of ways just in general is how we how we define empathy or our own personal like morals from person to person is and even i know this because we you know we're anthropology people yeah. <laughs> so much of that is influenced by socialization and yeah. um it's the process in itself is just so complex like we are all indoctrinated into yeah. the the rules and morals and values yeah and all that stuff of and whatever community is really yeah. powerful it's a very very it is powerful thing super powerful and mm-hmm. so it's very difficult for people to change their mindset or even be open to the idea of changing their mindset if you come at them straight away with something that completely can you know pushes against what they've been indoctrinated into believing their whole life um and I get that so I don't know there are plenty of people out there who totally respond well to sort of the guilt approach (laughs) I I wasn't really one of those people I actually would push back harder against that I wasn't one of those people initially like it took me a very 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 long time to get to where I was open and receptive to thinking about things differently in that way so um and then yeah. And then I know people who right away, overnight, they read a book and that was it. Right. <laughs> so I wasn't one of those people. I know. So, I wish I was one of those people, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Ready for news grab? Yeah. Because this news is a grab, good lead in. 
<laughs> Yay! Okay, so <clears throat> just be ready because I'm sure we're about to drop all of our listeners after this episode. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening this far. <laughs> Uh, hopefully this inspires people to leave reviews. Um, (laughs) So great. Okay. So this, this article, um, came out on March 4th, uh, 2020. So it's only a few days old, um, by BBC.com and it's called insert drum roll. Um, can, (laughs) can you feed cats and dogs a vegan diet? That that was good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, so this uh, article is by uh, Stephen Dowling. I started off like the first first little half of my summary here was super focused on this article, and then I sort of went off on a couple of little side gig tangents. So just bear with me. You um, went off on tangents, really? Never, <laughs> never. About vegan okay. pet food, I know. really? <laughs> what? What? Okay, so um, so most of what I have in this article came from, or most of what I have here <clears throat> came from that article, but I also pulled a few things from the FDA's website, FDA.gov. And um, another article that was, uh, oh, sorry, I think this was a blog post that was on poisonpets.com and also Wikipedia. (laughs) But but anyway, I'll post all the links on our website. Um, Okay, so veganism in the United States has risen by 600% in between 2014 and 2017. Wow. And so with this, there's been an increased interest in feeding cruelty-free pet food products to dogs and cats or figuring out ways of feeding more sustainable products, environmentally sustainable products to dogs and cats. Um, sustainability in pet food is something that uh, a lot of consumers probably don't really think about. Um But just to set the stage, so there was one 2017 study which concluded that pet food, the pet food industry dumps approximately 64 million tons of carbon dioxide into the air every year, which is the equivalent of driving 13 million cars. Um, So it's worth noting that this figure only considers the animals that end up in pet food. It doesn't take into account the resources used to raise those animals for slaughter. So resources being the acreage used to clear or the acreage cleared to grow crops, the crops that were then used to feed the animals, the water that those animals drink and so on and so forth. Um, So the main problem when we're talking about sustainability in pet food is that the pet population is growing. Um, So we can anticipate that our companion animals' carbon footprint will also grow. And in in 2017, the scientific journal uh, PLOS One, P-L-O-S, which I never heard of before. Oh, really? Yeah, that's pretty, it's pretty popular. It's a... Oh, it is? I've never heard about it before. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's it grabs like the latest like new the latest articles from like everything. It oh. kind of like updates you. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'll have yeah. to check it out. So they published a paper that estimated that U.S. cats and dogs um, ate the calorific equivalent of the diet of sixty three million Americans. Whoa. So I know, right? That's nuts. <laughs> So and, the well, data- and and it literally compared it to Americans, not just yeah, yeah, Ameri- this was so American diets, just Americans, yeah, oh. American diets, which are so great, <laughs> as we know. <laughs> we are so awesome in that category. Oh gosh. <laughs> Highly processed, <laughs> so, highly processed, ugh. like laden with animal products. Yeah, somebody did a. I forget who it is. If I find it, I'll post it on our Facebook page, but somebody did, I think it was last year or the year before somebody did a comparison of in my, I want to say Nat Geo, but I don't know if that's true, but it was a, it was a special where they compared diets from all across the world. And so they would take pictures of the family and then they'd put out on their table, like a week's worth of what they ate. And so it was kind of cool because, because you got to see like, 
what somebody in Guatemala eats versus somebody in Japan versus somebody in Russia or whatever. It might have been Nat Geo that did that. Was it? Okay, I'll have have to check. But America, (laughs) the American family, it was like all packaged stuff. (laughs) It was all plastic. (laughs) Chip bags and TV dinners. And I mean, there was some produce in there. But but anyway, this, yeah, it was a lot. So this data uh, from this paper uh, has contributed to an ever-growing controversial question, which is, are, are cats and dogs truly reliant on meat? Can they also thrive on a plant-based protein diet? After reading everything and summarizing stuff, uh, I personally just came to the conclusion that there's no real straight straightforward answer it's a little more complicated than a yes or a no (laughs) um like super complicated uh so there are some really important points of concern on both sides of that argument um so just to get the the primary ones out of the way there's a woman mentions in this article her name is daniela dos santos and she's the president of the british veterinary association and she says in the uk under the animal welfare act the owner has the obligation to feed the animal an appropriate diet if your personal belief system means you don't want to eat any animal protein that's fine but that diet is not designated to meet the welfare standards of your pet And Santos goes on to explain that cats are obligate carnivores and they require certain amounts of amino acids to be healthy. And the lack of these can lead to health problems. And for that reason, you wouldn't advise a vegetarian diet, let alone a vegan one. And uh, so one of the essential nutrients that's constantly brought up in this conversation is taurine. Mm -hmm. Um, And the ASPCA, which hopefully everybody knows, is the American Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Uh, They don't, so cats that don't have enough taurine are at risk of developing a potentially fatal condition called dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a condition that weakens the heart muscle that then prevents the heart from pumping blood and supplying oxygen, oxygen to the body normally. And so if it's left untreated, it is almost always fatal. Um, And domestic cats absorb taurine through their food and specifically from the meat product that's in mainstream pet food. So beef, chicken, fish, whatever else you happen to find. Um, So the ASPCA has expressed their own concerns about feeding cats a plant-based diet. And essentially they argue that cats cannot digest plant material well. They require essential nutrients that only meat can provide them. And they struggle with processing carbohydrates. Um, so all of that is absolutely true. Like, I don't think there's any question with that. I think that naturally uh, cats are obligate carnivores. Um, right. They're related to... They're related to the African wildcat, which that this is the piece I got from Wikipedia because I was like, well, what do African wildcats eat <laughs> normally? Um, and so these cats, they tend to eat gerbils, hares, other rodents, and oh, okay. like mid-sized birds, right? Yeah. And they also, this like blew my mind, because um, if you've ever seen pictures of an African wildcat, they're like pretty small, but they've, mm-hmm. they've been known to take down antelope fawns, lambs, and baby goats, wow. which I can't imagine. I mean, I could see that with bear. I could see him doing that. <laughs> well, Potentially. I mean, if they, do they ever it's hunt vicious. in packs? I Ooh, I didn't look that up. That's something worth looking hunt, up. Yeah, if they hunt in packs, then I could see that happening. Maybe. Like, I mean, yeah. hyenas take down huge animals that are yeah, they do. way bigger than they are. And hyenas are, I mean, they're kind of dogs, but they're also yeah, they are. kind of strange. <laughs> they're like little aliens. They <laughs> I are love them. Like little aliens. <laughs> You know what else is like an alien? My 13-pound rabbit that just hopped up in my bed with all my clean clothes oh, on it. And he is like oh. so proud of himself. He's about to build a He's a helper. Yeah. <laughs> He's a helper. So um, anyway, so the reason I went and looked up the little tidbit about these African wildcats is because usually the main argument against feeding dogs and cats plant-based pet food is rooted in whether or not cats are 
obligate carnivores. Um, right. And and this article talked about both dogs and cats. I'm mainly focusing on cats because I have cats and right. I didn't have enough time to also include dogs. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, so when we're talking about, okay, yeah, so they are obligate carnivores. But when somebody uses that as an argument, they're usually also pairing that with, well, we're feeding them food that is most appropriate for them, like most most naturally appropriate. But all yeah. cat food and dog food is heavily processed. It's out of a can or it's out of a package. Yeah. Um, so, in, I mean, to me, it seems like by default then that's not really true to their nature already. Um, both dry and wet food come with positive and negative uh, things. Like dry cat food, for example, is, well, it's thought to be better for maintaining a cat's dental health. Uh, it is also known to be difficult, more difficult to digest. Um, and cats, because they're related to desert animals, they're, uh, yeah. they absorb water a little differently than other animals. So they actually get, they're supposed to get most of their water from the food that they eat. So yeah. wet food is supposed to be easier on a cat's digestive tract. And it's more appropriate to help ensure that your cat is staying hydrated. I mean, and that's not to say take away your water dishes, leave the water dishes out, but, <laughs> but just saying like they're used to a higher moisture content. They're, mm -hmm. they're designed to take in a higher moisture content. Yeah. Um, so I'm personally super interested in this topic, which is why I was really excited to find this article. Um, and I just want to direct listeners to, a, another blog post we had that came out a few weeks ago. And if you go to our website, again, it's plantbasednationpod.com. Under the blog drop down tab, you'll see a link called guest authors. If you just click on that, you'll see a really awesome post that was published by Dr. Monica uh, Manzanares. And she is a veterinarian who owns a practice in Spain. And she is a vegan veterinarian who runs an entirely plant-based practice. They don't advocate and they don't sell any meat-based products, and wow. uh, which I thought was really cool. Um, yeah. But she includes a lot of good citations in her post and uh, advice to people who are interested in doing this. And she also um, offers like cautionary advice too. Like she clearly states that um, while dogs generally have an easier time transitioning because they're actually omnivores. Um, yeah. A lot of cats can transition safely as long as it's, it's done slowly, but around, I think she said around 10%, it's estimated about 10% of cats will not be able to transition. So oh, wow. she just says essentially, yeah, she says, <clears throat> you know, if you're interested in doing it, mm -hmm. you should definitely notify your veterinarian, you know, be smart about it. Um, monitor, um, their health as you go and you want to do it under the supervision of a vet. Um, and, but it's a little tricky because in the United States, this is still very much a new concept. Whereas other places like Canada and Europe, it's been an ongoing thing for decades. Um, which is something mm. that I think a lot of American consumers don't know about. Like you can buy in a lot of pet stores in Europe, you can buy plant-based uh, dog or cat food. It's not that big a deal. It's not as taboo as it is here. Um, right. You're probably not so, going to have someone like telling you you're abusing your animals. Exactly. Yeah. I like, mean, they still have, have people your... over there. who. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and so in her article, she notes, uh, or in her blog post, she cites something by a Dr. Andrew Knight, who uh, strongly believes that rates of diseases such as cancer, kidney, and liver disease are higher in domestic animals, specifically domestic cats and dogs that consume mainstream meat-based food um, than what would occur naturally in the wild. And the theory 
that Dr. Knight proposes is that if cats and dogs were exposed over many years to toxins, not severe enough to cause acute reactions, but sufficient enough to cause cellular damage, one might expect to see higher rates of cancer, kidney disease, and liver disease, uh, particularly if those animals are ingesting toxins as part of their regular diet. And when I've gotten into this conversation with other people, they look at me first like I have 10 heads. <laughs> But also, um, because they're like, how, because they're like, how can my yeah. pet be ingesting toxins? Like, is that right? What... Yeah, it's usually that. And do they not usually... realize what kind of animal products go into like no. every single kind of, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think people realize. They and don't realize can I, it, I guess. no, and can I just pause and say that, you know, a few years ago when I was having issues with one of my other cats who was a senior and he ended up, you know, passing away, um, but not because of the pet food I gave him. <laughs> I, I took, I, I was concerned and I took, I took the pet food that I had and I brought it to the vet clinic with me, with my cat and gave it to my vet and said, this is what I'm feeding him. And it, you know, it is a plant-based uh, wet food. Could this be making him sick? And I told her, you know, it is AFCO approved and yeah. Um, AFCO, for those that don't know, is basically like a national organization that designs the nutrition standards for cats and dogs. And in order for a pet food to be sold um, in a pet store, it has to have the AFCO sort of stamp of approval. And your vets will only recommend that you serve or you you give your pets AFCO approved food um, because it's known to meet certain nutritional standards. So when I asked her about it. And I was like, oh, it's AFCO approved, I swear. But you know, if it's making him sick, like, I'm totally open to changing what I'm feeding him right now, whatever. And she was so excited that I even knew who AFCO was, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> and then second of all, I told her, yeah, this is a plant based food. And it was a can of wet food. And she was like, Oh, my gosh, I've heard of this stuff. Can I take a picture of it? Like she was so yeah. giddy. <laughs> And then, you know, for her, she had said, well, she's like, no, there's no judgment here. And she looked at the nutritional uh, content and then we started talking about it. And she even said, she's like, most people have no idea what goes into their pet food or like what's what's even allowed legally to go in pet food. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's horrendous. Like it is. It not. is horrendous. They would not be happy. No. Um no, Which is why won't. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them right now what's in their pet food. All right, <laughs> so, go for it. <laughs> so, here we go. Okay, so um, getting back to this. So some may wonder, how can pet food carry toxins? So there's many reasons why. Um, the main one, up until April 30th of 2019, which I was happy to hear that there was this small change. But before I get there, up until April 30th, 2019, it was totally okay for the pet food industry to use what's called 4D meat as the base for their pet food products. So 4D meat is a label given to meat from dead, dying, diseased, and disabled animals that are considered, you know, too unhealthy for human consumption. Um, it can also include old or spoiled supermarket meat. And also large numbers of rendered dogs and cats from animal shelters, uh, restaurant grease, and high concentrations of hazardous free radicals and trans fatty acids, damaged or spoiled fish, uh, and oh, which of course include potentially dangerous levels of mercury, PCBs, oh, right. and other toxins. And here's the fun thing that I didn't know about. So we've had all these pet food recalls over the last few years. It seems like every year there's there's at least one. Yeah. Um, but those dogs and cats that are being euthanized at shelters, for those that are going to these rendering plants, um, you know, when they die, they've got the euthanasia drugs in them. And so that would then be going into the pet food, which then your cat and dog are eating. Um, there, there was a recall last year because there were very high levels of that euthanasia, those euthanasia drugs found in a particular brand of pet food, um, which is crazy. It's that, what is it called? Pentobarbital, I think is what it's called. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, in 2019, in April, 
the FDA withdrew the compliance policies that permitted the use of this stuff in pet food, which that's good. Um, right. So it's a big <laughs> step forward. Yay. Uh, but <laughs> there is a lot of concern, though, about how that's going to be regulated or how they're even going to be able to um, make sure that every single pet food company in the country is following that standard. Like, how are they going to be able to make sure that um, how are they going to be able to maintain that regulation or enforce it? You know, um, especially since the FDA, you know, when asked that, they wrote back to this particular petitioner saying that we don't believe that the use of diseased animals or animals that have died otherwise than by slaughter to make animal food poses a safety concern. And we intend to use enforcement discretion where appropriate. So now the question see. is, <laughs> the question is, <laughs> oh, my God, where where are they going to say it's appropriate or not? You know? Um, so oh yeah, I know it's been great. So anyway, there, there are lots of companies out there now. Uh, one is called Amicat it's from Italy evolution, which is based in Canada, Benevo, which I think is based in the UK. I think those are the three most popular brands that have been around and they are decades old. They've been around for a long time. Um, and they're all fortified with, taurine. And so all of those foods are fortified with the essential nutrients cats and dogs need, including taurine for cats. And we actually have a new company that was just on Shark Tank um, called Wild Earth. I don't know if you've seen their ads on Facebook, but they're, they really push it on social media. Um, it was co-founded by Ryan Bethencourt, who's a scientist who was heavily involved in future food startups. And he was inspired to create an animal product-free food, uh, partly because of recalls. Um, and then there's, so for those people who are interested in feeding a more sustainable product, but they're like nervous about, you know, going plant-based, um, there's another company called Chippin, which was founded by Haley Russell and Laura Colagrande. And they make a pet food from insects, um, which are known to be a more sustainable protein source yes, um, and large scale agribusiness. So I kind of foresee that's probably the direction that pet food will eventually go. Yeah. I think is insect based, which is um, more sustainable. It's much more sustainable. Oh yeah, it is. So uh, it's been calculated that beef cattle need eight grams of feed in order to grow one gram of protein, whereas insects only need two grams of feed to create one gram of protein. Mm. Um, they use crickets, and so crickets require much less water, which is uh, already a huge concern uh, to farmers in many regions. Right. And the food that they make includes 10 of the essential amino acids uh, that dogs need. So their food right now is intended strictly for dogs. Mm -hmm. um, crickets, crickets don't emit methane, um, potential greenhouse gas, and uh, the production of this stuff also creates less agricultural runoff. Um, so I don't know. Ultimately, I think the decision to provide these food alternatives is up to, you know, the guardian of the cat or dog. I think there's a lot of good points to be made on both sides of the debate. Um, as mentioned earlier, Dr. Menzaneras, who put her blog post on our Plant-Based Nation website, uh, she wholeheartedly supports cats consuming a vegan diet under the close supervision of a veterinarian so that the transition to pet food can be done slowly and safely. And just to wrap up, uh, I'll just pull a quote from her post. She says, it is true that long-term studies are still needed to assess the complete safety of vegan food for cats. So far, there is only a report written by Lorelli Wakefield and published in 2006, where 34 cats that have been fed a commercial or homemade vegetarian diet for over a year were evaluated. And it's a small sample and further investigation is needed, but the results were positive. Uh, serum cobalamine, which I don't know what that is, concentrations and blood taurine concentrations were determined and all were within the reference range with the exception of taurine concentrations in three cats that didn't receive any vitamin supplement, though they were described as healthy by their caregivers. Um, hmm. And so I mentioned earlier, people look at me like I have 10 heads when I bring this topic up, but <laughs> one, it's because they don't realize 
how, um, you know, potentially unhealthy mainstream pet foods are. Yeah. But also when I say plant-based protein, pet food, I think people are envisioning like throwing a carrot in the food dish or a can of chickpeas and that's it. And they don't, they don't realize that, no, there's actually, there are actually AFCO approved plant-based pet foods out there that have been fortified with the same nutrients as every other mainstream pet food. Yeah. Um, and there are people that mix their own stuff and get vitamin supplements and feed that to their dogs and cats. But I personally, I feel like that's too risky. So I'm not comfortable with that at all. So (laughs) I don't trust myself. (laughs) I was a vet or a pet nutritionist maybe, but, um, so yeah, but, uh, yeah, that's my article. Yeah. Nice. That's it. I mean, yeah. I, like you and I have talked a lot about plant based pet foods. So I don't yeah. have a whole lot to like. I, I'm glad you chose that article because I think oh, it good. Does needs to be <laughs> talked about a lot more in America. I think so because, too. And like, I have, like, my mom works for the local Humane Society and. Right. Whenever I mention like plant based diets for dogs or cats, she's just like, no. They freak out. No. (laughs) We don't do that. That's animal abuse. Like Yeah, and you know, it would be if you're giving your cat green beans or your dog just green beans. (laughs) Yeah, it would be. But (laughs) yeah. Yeah, no. And I think too, people don't realize like how supplemented every food is it really is in America already. Like yeah. And the amount of fabrication that goes into developing a food product that, right. I mean, we were just talking about like how much Americans eat that comes from a package. Like, yeah. And, and same for our pets. don't realize the horrendous nature of the animal products that go into pet food. Like, no. cancer ridden like literally literally, literally like, cancer ridden like you can see <laughs> the cancer on yeah. the flesh of the like what's going into the food like it's yeah it's correct what they do at a lot of these um at these processing plants too like before they're you know as they're I guess they've already slaughtered the animals. So now they're cutting the portions that are eventually going to make it to the supermarket. Um, You know, the people who are doing that, they're trained to actually cut out any tumors or ulcers or sketchy tissues that they observe. And they do so that the consumer doesn't see it. But then all of that goes somewhere. And that stuff is the 4D meat. And that stuff is what was going into pet food. And I just watched a thing... Um, it was a video recently about, uh, it was a group that had like a, a vigil at a slaughterhouse and they waited until the animals got slaughtered and they're outside and they're dumping the waste products of that process into a truck that was going to go to one of these rendering plants. And, (laughs) and you see all these, all these mishmash parts, right. That people aren't going to eat, but then they also are throwing away, all of the ear tags. So all those plastics are going into that. Uh, that's going to go to the rendering plant. And to top it off, before they sent the truck off, they dumped a huge, huge load of ammonia on top, I guess, so that it oh. wouldn't like rot, rot while during while transit. Because yeah. I, don't, yeah, I don't know how far it had to go, right. the truck. Possibly but it's like, the country, what the right. hell? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Wow. How is this okay? <laughs> so it's soil yeah. and green. Yeah, it's great. So yeah, I think it's and I think too, I mean, I I would encourage too, if people are interested in this, there's a good book called Obligate Carnivore, um, written by a former vet tech who talks about all this stuff. And it's fairly well researched. You can buy it on Amazon. It's super cheap. It's like nine bucks. Um, And even if you don't choose to go this route, you'll learn a lot about uh, the pet food industry in general, which I think is still worthwhile. And I don't know, I think, I think too, like, this is not like a cut and dry issue, even within the world of veterinary medicine, like there are veterinarians who are open to the idea now, like newer generation vets coming out. I definitely believe you should absolutely tell your vet you're feeding your animals, whatever you're feeding them. I think that's important. 
even if you're worried about a stigma, it's important you need to tell them because if there really isn't any long-term consequence of doing it, the only way that those naysayers within that, that world are going to start to believe that is if they know that they have clients who are feeding their animals this and don't see any long-term consequences of doing this, right. you know? Um, and there's no, that's that report that the vet mentioned in her blog post. I think that also touched on the concerns about um, potential, like a higher increase in UTIs maybe with cats. Mm. And there's no data, there's absolutely no data to suggest as of right now that feeding plant-based pet foods will inevitably lead to developing bladder crystals. That's just something that some cats get, some dogs get, and some don't. Um, But it is said if you want to work with cats, you should monitor their urine pH because if they get, if it gets too alkaline from the plant-based stuff that there's supplements you can give them to sort of balance Mm -hmm. out their pH. Um, Yeah, it's an interesting Hmm. topic. I, I've, I've been feeding, um, my cats aren't totally plant-based, but I do give them Benevo dry food and I get compliments on their health Mm -hmm. all the time, their coats and everything. And they're, yeah, your cats are gorgeous. (laughs) Thank you. Um, (laughs) Gracie, Gracie gets right now, she, she has a chronic health issue. So for her, well, I don't know. For her, I'm just worried about changing her diet. So she gets the plant-based stuff, but then she also gets like a digestive sensitive wet food um, because she has like, oh, yeah. she has like cr- chronic IBS and um, mm-hmm. sometimes she'll get constipated if she eats too much dry or, and she's been so finicky ever since I've gotten her, like any sort of change to her food has like yeah. upset her tummy. So Made her. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like you just kind of have to be smart about it too. Like if you've got a cat with yeah. a chronic condition, maybe it's not a good choice, but you could at least go 50, 50. So, and reduce right. your, um, contribution to the carbon footprint of the world a little bit. And then, yeah, I don't know. Bear doesn't seem to give a shit. So he seems fine. <laughs> he actually stopped having as many IBS flares when I transitioned him and his liver enzymes stabilized. Like they, they went back to like within normal range. Whereas prior to that, they were elevated, I guess, for a little while, um, which was kind of weird. Um, so, so yeah, he seems fine. They haven't had any issues so far. And Henry loved it when Henry was around my poor Henry, but so, yeah. All right. So it's time for switch out. Swiss, 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 switch thing. out. <laughs> I'm working on it. I know. It's so good. Okay. So for my switch out in this episode, I wanted to cover a product that I got recently through the Kinder Beauty Box subscription. Ooh. I know. Um, so it's called the Dirty Lamb Tea Tree Wands. And I just really like the name what? of it. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> You, have, you don't uh, want to know what I'm picturing right now about this well, product. It's, it's not actually dirty, but it's fine. <laughs> it's called The Dirty Lamb, and their website is at uh, thedirtylamb.com. And uh, let's see, it came with, let's see, I think it came with the February box for Kinder Beauty Box, which if you want to know what that is, go to our website, plantbasednationpod.com, and check the online store tab. I really like this stuff. It's made out of uh, witch hazel, tea tree oil, a few other ingredients, and then uh, cinnamon. And Mm -hmm. it's basically a blemish stick is what it is. And yeah, and I really liked it. And the the reason I like it is because the regular, whatever, over the counter stuff that has benzoyl peroxide. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that. That, like, burns the crap out of my skin. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, it's super harsh. Super harsh. Yeah, really harsh. Mm -hmm. It hurts. And then. Um, And then. Yeah, salicylic acid, which is the other one. Um, that is so harsh, you aren't supposed to use it while you're pregnant. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. So those are the two main ingredients (laughs) that are fight are supposed to fight acne. Yeah. And they're so that's cool. It sounds like that stick would smell really good too. 
Yeah, it smells really good. And uh, I have that uh, over the last couple of years, I've noticed that um, I've gotten that, what's it called? I think it's called, pronounced like Milia or Melia, um, which are these teeny tiny little um, cysts. It's basically acne, but for women, it usually pops up where you apply your eye makeup or your concealer. Yeah, I picked and... one today. <laughs> Oh, cool. I know you're not Thanks. supposed to pick them, but That's I did. That's okay. Well, you know, I've been looking into ways to get rid of mine for a few weeks mm. um, because I finally was like, how do I get this off my face? Because I have a lot of them and mm. um, they gross me out. And <laughs> so <laughs> I was watching uh, Dr. Pimple Popper on YouTube. Yes, and I love her. I- I love her too. And so the way that she she does it is she basically numbs each one and then she zaps it with a little carterizer tool oh. and and the heat from that tool dries out the the contents of these little these little cysts and then you can oh, wow. just she'll just pop the stuff out. And I was like, "Sure, I could do that." <laughs> um and <laughs> And then I got this tea tree wand instead, and actually it shrunk up all of my little spots within oh, cool. a couple of weeks. So yeah, I highly recommend it, especially if you're somebody who has that skin condition. Um, you can still see, if you look really close, you can still see where they were, but they're not nearly as noticeable. Like I can, I can deal with what I've got right now. Right. Yeah. Witch um, hazel is so good for your skin. Like it, it is. It I is love it. So yeah, it is. And, um, cinnamon is a, and I think it's supposed to be an anti-inflammatory too. Yeah. So I need to find helpful. something without tea tree oil because my skin has a really weird reaction to it. it oh, are you it- allergic to it? I might be. It makes me itch. Like I can't. Really? I've, yeah, I've tried to use shampoos with tea tree oil in them. Oh, no. it makes my head itch so badly. And like really? I do. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate right. because well, don't, it's supposed don't to be like really good, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like it smells so good. <laughs> yeah, it smells really good, and it does tingle quite a bit. Like when you oh. apply it. Mm. Hold on one second. EJ would like to chime in. Hold on. <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, okay. Cel- <laughs> he's, he's telling me this. <laughs> Ceylon cinnamon is the good cinnamon. <laughs> oh. And then all the other cinnamon is usually made out of uh, cassia cinnamon. Oh. And hmm. yeah. And so cinnamon has, hold on. I looked this up earlier. This is where- do you just want to come and do a voiceover, EJ? Come on, EJ. <laughs> Chime in. What, come, what, what is it called? You have a scientific guest spot. <laughs> okay, so coumarin <laughs> um, is what is in the cassia type of cinnamon, and high levels of it can cause liver damage. And a lot of countries oh. have actually outlawed the use of cassia cinnamon in grocery stores and as a food ingredient but the united states Mm -hmm. hasn't gotten on board with that yet so of course not (laughs) so so but um you can also find a ceylon cinnamon at thrivemarket.com which we have a link oh cool website too yeah um which delivers (laughs) yeah which delivers um and i'm not sure let's see this one so yeah, the I guess the downside with this product is that it has the cassia cinnamon in it, but but don't eat um, it. Yeah, just don't eat it. <laughs> so so don't eat it. <laughs> but I really like the I really like the product. I think it's made my skin like a lot. Um, I don't know. It's not as broken out as it was. Um, oh, it has spearmint oil, so maybe that's why it tingles. Ooh. That's oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. got a bunch of good stuff in there. That's cool. Yep. 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 All Very right. cool. So what do you have? So my switch out is an oldie but a goodie. Yeah. Here, I'm EJ. doing the podcast. <laughs> EJ, <laughs> EJ forgot we were recording. He thought I was just talking to you. <laughs> hi, EJ. <laughs> Holly says hi. Hey. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. <laughs> So 
my switch out is using cotton rags instead of paper towels. Oh, we do that. We do that. Yay. Me too. So I still keep paper towels in my house. Um, right. For me one, too. yeah, I have a toddler. Um, and two, uh, sometimes there's just stuff you don't want to have to wash off of a rag. There's the reason yeah. why I don't use washable diapers. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but for most things, for most messes, I don't need something that's disposable. So I've gotten into the habit that I love of using rags. Um, and I use like pretty good cotton rags, so they're pretty absorbent. And I use my force of nature because that's a disinfectant anyway, but it's a non-bleach disinfectant, so it's super easy to use. Um, right. And I love it. It's good. Made, yeah, like it's made my waste consumption go way down. I wish yeah. I was one of those people – who could use flannel squares for toilet paper. But I know. That's, I'm that's just not. so hardcore. Well, you know what? We might have an opportunity to. If things we might. I, well, <laughs> but we might get there. And I should be mentally preparing myself for that. Um, but I will say not being dependent on paper towels is really nice. Because I grew up in a house where paper towels, we were constantly buying paper towels. And not only is it a hassle to drag paper towels in and out of the house but if right. they're so freaking expensive they and are expensive. so wasteful and yes, so they are it was a hard habit to break I'm not gonna lie uh, because it's so easy to just grab a paper towel but yeah. once I got in the habit of washing rags and folding them I now right enjoy like setting my rags up and I have enough to where I ha I only have to wash them like once every two weeks because I have yeah. that many and yeah. so I I have them in a bag and I fold them and I stack them and I have them under my sink well, and good. I have my force of nature by my sink and I even got the kids at school to start using them because oh, I teach good. art so I was yeah. like guys let's just like not be dependent on paper towels for one, like we're going through a giant roll of paper towels every day. And this is freaking me. Right. Like, so I took some rags in and the kids were, they used them and then they were asking for them and I had to take oh, them good. and wash them. And then I forgot to take them back the next day. We were like, where are our rags? Aww. So yeah. Well, that's so, good. Yeah. That's my switch out. Yeah, we use those too. We have a whole bunch of them in the kitchen. It wasn't something that I used to do. It was something that EJ did. And then um, I ended up doing it because of that. <laughs> but <laughs> now that I'm we're, used to it. We're force coerced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, but I actually like it. It's a lot. Uh, yeah, it's cheaper, like you said. And we also use them for, um, let's see, we use them as paper towels, but, uh, oh, we use them as napkins too. Like we don't have real oh, yeah. napkins. Yeah. Um, I don't we, ever buy paper napkins. Like yeah. never, they're never in I my house. I used to, I used to, cause when I grew up, that's what we had uh, were paper yeah, napkins. Me paper too. Towels. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, why? Like, why? Right. Well, that's, <laughs> why I don't buy I... paper plates either. And I grew up eating off of paper plates. And I, when I was out on my own, I was like, I'm not spending money on paper no, plates. No, it's this so is the much most money. Thing in the world. It is so much money. And it's so Indeed. much trash. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. It is. Oh, I just, I can't. I might look in, I have, having a toddler and now having, I mean, now I have a three-year-old and basically a five-year-old in the house quite a bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I'm looking into compostable paper plates. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I might look into that. That's the only way I would ever, I told my boyfriend that's the only way I'd ever have paper plates in the house is if they were 100% compostable and like sure. composted within a couple of months, not a couple right. of weeks. Right. A reasonable amount of time. <laughs> right. Right. We get, um, so we get the compostable plastic 
uh, bags with our misfit orders. Oh. And yeah, so they, it depends on who is packing the box, but usually they're, they'll put like green beans or, um, not celery, but green beans, sometimes radishes end up in those little produce bags. Oh, okay. Um, Brussels sprouts, things like that. And so they'll put them in the compostable produce bags, which I don't, I don't know if you've seen those Uh before, but um, they will compost like in your own compost, which is really cool. So nice. Yeah. So we try to do that. No, that's a good switch out. I like that. We should do more of those like little things around the house that aren't necessarily like name brand, but more lifestyle option. I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that those are going to come into sharp relief very quickly here soon. I think so too. So I think that's it. I think that's all we have for today. Um, so thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Uh, check out our website, check us out on social media, on Instagram. We are plant based nation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're on Twitter and we're on Facebook and we're on Facebook and our website is plantfacednationpod.com. Yes, you got it. All right. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Bye.